A group of four divers planned to have a thrilling 80-minute cave dive in the Kalimba Cenote in Mexico. It started exactly as planned, but by the end of this dive, only two would barely make it out alive. This is the fatal breakdown of the Kalimba Cenote diving accident. Cave divers are always exposed to a high level of life and death risk. Experienced cave divers are well aware of the ever-present danger and learn to manage the various elements as they gain experience. In December of 2004, a group of nine divers would be heading out for their second dive together during a vacation in Mexico. They would be entering in the Kalimba Cenote, following several main guidelines and a couple of short connecting jump lines. They would then come up in the Bosch Chen Cenote before returning the way they came. Married couple Jean and Bill Downing were experienced cave divers who had completed over 300 cave dives and had been certified for almost 30 years. They were paired with two friends who had been certified cave divers for over 20 years. Kent Hirsch had done 125 dives and Michael Nast had done 75 dives. They had been diving together for years and came to Mexico to experience some of the 228 miles of mapped tunnels in the Sac Actun system of cenotes. These two pairs were grouped together because they had similar gas consumption rates. This is a very individualized rate based on size, experience, comfort, and natural breathing rates. When out on a cave dive, the rule is to consume only one third of your air tank on the trip out. That leaves one third for the trip back and one third for emergencies or unexpected obstacles. This group was well prepared and had completed a dive in these cenotes just two days before. They would be entering the cave as the second team. The plan was that team one, with the professional guide, would go first and place markers on the lines to set the path. They had more efficient breathers in that group, so they would go a little farther than team two before they planned to turn around. Team one moved along the Kalimba main line to its end, where there was a short jump line to the main Paso de la Garto line. It was just a short trip down that line to jump over to the main Bosch Chen line. That team would be able to surface in the Bosch Chen Cenote and look around for a few minutes before heading back the way they came. During this initial trip, the guide set personal non-directional markers on the lines to note which ways they went and which jump lines they had installed. The small PNDMs, usually called cookies, were both a marker for themselves and a messaging system with Team 2. Team 2's plan was to follow the same path as Team 1, but once they reached the Bosch Chen line, they would likely be at the turnaround point, based on projected air consumption. This meant that they would actually be the first to exit, and Team 1 would be behind them. And this is exactly what happened. When Team 1 came to the Bosch Chen connection, they saw that the cookie had been removed by Team 2, as was the protocol they had discussed during planning. The first team to leave the tunnel would remove the cookie, letting the second team know that they had already passed. This would cause the second team to remove the jump lines they had installed, so things would be left clean for future divers. As the guide led his team out, he pulled all of the jump lines since the markers had been removed. After 99 minutes in the water, Team 1 re-emerged in the Kalimba Cenote with their group of five. After exiting the water and looking around, there was no sign of the other team. They clearly had left the tunnels ahead of them, so there was no doubt they should be here waiting. A frantic search started, and the guide even made the short drive over to Gran Cenote to see if they had emerged there instead. There was absolutely no sign of the four divers. They regrouped back at Cenote Kalimba and began gearing up to go back in the tunnel. 30 minutes had passed since they had surfaced, and it was obvious that the other group would have less air with their consumption rates. Suddenly, bubbles were seen in the water, followed by two divers quickly surfacing. They frantically explained the incredible story of what had just happened in those caves. Things were going smoothly for the second group. The four divers were moving along the main lines as planned. Bill Downey was taking pictures with an underwater camera while everyone enjoyed the serene beauty of the caves. There were several tight restrictions that took slow and deliberate efforts to move through safely, but they took their time getting through as their air supply was abundant at this point. They went the full distance of the Kalimba line, jumped over to the Paso de Lagarto for a short three-minute swim, then jumped over to the Bosch Chen line. Michael checked his pressure and notified the group that they had hit the thirds mark, and it was time to turn around. They pulled the Bosch Chen cookie and traveled down the jump to the Paso de Lagarto main line. When they got to the main Paso line, despite the line marker, they inexplicably turned left. All four divers went this way without question. 
The trip should have been less than three minutes for the 65-foot swim to reach the jump back to Kalimba, but somehow they continued for an astonishing 1,400 feet before realizing their grave mistake. They were at the end of the Paso main line, nearly 3,000 feet away from their intended exit. They knew there was a long jump to reach the Gran Cenote main line that they had dived days before. This exit would be just 300 feet away, and they would be safely out of the water. Kent connected his safety line to the end of the Paso main line and started searching for the Gran Cenote main. It was a long 70-foot gap, so he really had to trust that it would appear any moment. After swimming for several minutes, his safety line pulled him to a stop. Incredibly, it wasn't long enough to traverse the gap. He looked at his pressure gauge and knew that he must quickly make a decision as time was running short. He returned to the Paso main line and could barely see the distant lights of divers swimming away. They had left him there. He felt a little frantic and swam after them until he caught up to the group. While Kent had been searching for the Grand Main Line, Michael had decided to turn back. He saw that air was running down, and a quick calculation would show that they must head back the way they came right now, if there was any chance to make it out to the Kalimba Cenote. These incredible tunnels were long and interesting, but there were absolutely no pockets of air down there. If your tanks ran out, that was it. The Downies were making the same realization that air was reaching a critical point of decision. It would be easy to panic, realizing how far away you were from the exit, trapped in these narrow water-filled tunnels with no quick solutions. They saw Michael leaving and had not seen Kent for several minutes. Quickly, they decided to go back toward the known path and followed Michael out. At least they could be sure that if they traveled back the way they came, they would definitely encounter the jump to go back to Kalimba. Staying calm and decisive was essential to preserve the air in their tanks and make it out alive. After a tense 25 minutes of swimming, they found the jump and were now back on the main Kalimba line heading toward the open-air cenote, just 30 more minutes ahead. Bill could see that his air tank now had only 200 psi left and he could feel the diminishing air in each breath. He pulled up to Jean and they began sharing air using the emergency extra mouthpiece attached to her tanks. When it came to the tight restrictions, Bill had to wait while Jean squeezed through, holding his breath while he worked through the restriction himself, then quickly locating Jean and the lifeline of air. In this method, they would be moving carefully together through the water, trying to slow down their exertion and breathing as they were still 15 minutes from the exit. Michael was ahead of them, but he'd slowed to nearly a stop. When they passed him, he could see that they were already sharing gas, so there was no option for him to get help from them. His tank was almost empty, and he was sucking it dry while trying to find a source of air. The light from Kent was coming up the tunnel, and with it came an emergency supply of air. Kent gave Michael his emergency mouthpiece from his tank and tried to calm him to preserve the remaining air. Michael had the least cave diving experience in the group, and based on his solo exit from the end of the line earlier, he was feeling the stress of the situation. Kent was a loyal friend and did not succumb to panic himself. Michael and Kent continued to move down the Kalimba line and hoped that their air would stretch the last 1,000 feet of swimming ahead of them. When Jean and Bill pierced the surface of the cenote, they had less than 500 psi in Jean's tank. It would have been gone in just a few more minutes. Had they waited at the end of Paso de Lagarto for Kent to return, they may have run out of air just feet from the exit. It was a devastating moment of survival. They told the guide and others that they had seen lights from Kent and Michael behind them, so they couldn't be too far away. The guide and a couple of divers entered the tunnel to find the two men, hoping to offer their own extra mouthpieces if needed. Just 250 feet inside, lights were seen in the tunnel, but they weren't moving. Both men had drowned. It was a stunning realization that they were only five minutes from the exit. If they had just turned around without searching for the Grand Cenote main line, or if they had realized they were going the wrong way just a minute or two sooner, or if Michael had stayed more relaxed and used his air more efficiently, they could have made it. After a complete analysis of what went wrong, it was determined that each member should have been placing their own cookies on lines marking their way. This would have put the responsibility in each person's hands. If this had happened, then likely at least one of the four would have recognized that they were turning the wrong way. It also should have been obvious after several minutes that they had not reached their turnoff as expected. The Downey's cave diving experience and Jean's low consumption rate probably saved their lives. 
Kent and Michael were sadly lost doing what they loved, knowing the enormous risk that was inherent in every dive.